ASIC 250 students. We're on chapter 16 now. It's my final set of videos for this semester. And I'll be honest with you, I was kind of delaying doing this last set of videos only because it's kind of like the last time I'll be connected with you, at least we can see my image and hear my lectures. Uh, I'll probably have to redo the entire process all over again for summer. We're not sure about fall at this point in time. But um, these have kind of been especially made for this class only. So uh, it's not like I can reuse them again, nor would I want to. Uh, so let's get on with the show. Our last chapter, I think, is a pretty interesting chapter because it deals with law and ethics. And this is a concern when it comes to abnormal psychology because every day we see things happening that we don't feel is very right. Uh, we see people being sometimes, in our view, abused by the police who might be mentally ill. We see people roaming the streets who we wonder to ourselves, where is their family? Why isn't their family taking care of them? Why aren't they in a hospital? Why aren't they receiving medications? And of course, throughout the semester, we've realized that this is a a weird gray area that affects us that we know that some people get away with very unethical things uh, the law protects us as individuals and so we have battles in our own society as to individual rights for example should i have the right to go surfing when i want to even though the governor says you should stay off the beaches and you should stay away from the water uh, people sometimes make their own decisions. So when we look back in history and I look at how things have changed dramatically, we see this advertisement for doctors recommending that you smoke camel cigarettes. And uh, this is pretty common practice, sports stars, etc., promoting very unhealthy behaviors. And it hasn't really changed a whole lot today. Uh, we may not see doctors recommending um, to smoke, but we'll still see sports stars recommending a variety of different foods or beverages that aren't necessarily the health, most healthiest for you. Right? I'll start off with a case study today. And the name of the case study is called, And the Walls Moved. And the Walls Moved moved. It takes place in the city that I went to school in. And I went to school at Eastern Michigan University, at that time home of the Hurons, now home of the Eagles. And the, the name of the city that Eastern Michigan University is in is called Ypsilanti, Michigan. Now, don't be too alarmed if you've never heard of Ypsilanti, Michigan. Because growing up in Detroit, I'll be honest with you, I never heard of Ypsilanti, Michigan until I actually went to school there. And I wound up spending six and a half years living in the city of Ypsilanti, Michigan, and going to school there, getting my uh, BS, uh, Bachelor's of Science, not the other BS, and MS, uh, which is not muscular uh, sclerosis, but uh, it is... Um, a master's of science in clinical psychology. And one of the advantages of when you get into your major, you get into your upper level courses, and sometimes that happens more so at the university when you transfer, is that um, you get to do a lot more hands-on type stuff. And students love hands-on type stuff. That's why I'm not crazy about this process right here, because I'm not with you, and we're not doing hands-on type stuff. We have to do everything kind of electronically. It doesn't mean you can't do it on your own. It just, it's just a different vibe to it. Um, but one of the classes I had was to uh, visit group homes, and we were to assess uh, what was happening at those homes, uh, what kind of treatment the people were receiving, what kind of disorders the individuals had. I think if you remember the case of No Joy in Comics, that was one of the group homes I visited. 
on another occasion, I, I was sent to a group home uh, and again, not having a lot of experience with a seriously mentally ill people, I wasn't sure what to expect, what the residents were all about. Um, the group home was, of course, notified I was coming for a visit. And I was there just to evaluate, not necessarily in the individual residents there or their illnesses, but just kind of what kind of activities were offered to these individuals, what kind of psychosocial activities. I mean, basically, some places provided a roof, food, you know, a place to sleep, and so forth. Other places provided not just that, but all kinds of enrichment activities where individuals could improve themselves, maybe job training skills, educational opportunities, um, cultural events, you name it. So I get there early to this home. I always like to be early if I can. And um, when I knock at the door, they let me in the living room. And the first thing I notice about the living room is it's completely dark. I mean, nearly pitch black dark. All the windows are covered. There's no lights on. The only reason I can see a little bit is because in the distance, in the kitchen, I believe, the manager is taking care of some stuff and there's a light on in the kitchen. And that's just giving a little bit of light in the living room. So the person that let me in said, you know, the manager will be with you in a couple minutes. Why don't you have a seat here on this couch? Now, I kind of had to let my eyes adjust a little bit before I could find the couch because it was really that dark. And so I sat down. Now, I'm I'm nervous and I don't know what to expect. And, and, and you know, gosh, well, who will I meet? And, you know, is this a safe environment? And you know how when your imagination takes off, you, you, you start to experience all kinds of thoughts and maybe some crazy ideas. And so I started staring at the walls. And I could swear I could see the walls moving. And I thought, oh, my gosh, I've only been here for a couple minutes. And I think I caught something. I'm, I'm starting to hallucinate. That's one of the symptoms of mental illness. I mean, uh, I, I imagine seeing things on the walls. I don't, maybe they're not there, but I can see them. And so I, and I'm thinking, okay, calm down. You know, breathing, breathing. So I start staring more and more. And it takes, it takes our eyes. We're, we're not designed to be night creatures. It takes our eyes approximately 20 minutes to adjust to the darkness. I know some of you are night creatures, but that's another story for another day. But um, so I'm staring at the walls, I'm staring and staring, and I'm trying to remain calm, and I can see the walls moving. They actually are moving. Now, I want you to take a minute and think about the possibilities. Why are they moving? Now, I know some of you are thinking, earthquake. Wasn't an earthquake. In Michigan, on occasion, very rarely, they do have earthquakes, but I experienced one in my entire lifetime in Michigan. Uh, but it wasn't an earthquake. Had I been drinking? No, I had not been drinking. <laughs> not that early in the morning. Um, was I under the influence of drugs? No, I'm sorry to disappoint you. No, I was not under the influence of drugs. I don't think I even had caffeine that morning. Uh, give up. Well, when my eyes, eyes adjusted to the darkness, I saw thousands and thousands of cockroaches on the walls, moving constantly. And it gave the illusion that the wall was moving. And I know some of you are pretty grossed out. Let me tell you, when my eyes focused and I noticed that they were cockroaches, I figured, oh my goodness, they're on the wall, so they must be on the couch, and so they must be on me. So I immediately jumped out of my chair and I started scratching. You know how you start getting imagination that there's bugs on you? Actually, we do have all kinds of creatures on us, but that's another story for another day. But um, I was horrified. When the manager came to 
to to meet with me, he flipped on the light. And you know how sometimes if you've got cockroaches, you turn on the light, they weren't scattering. No, they just stood there like, yes, what do you want? You know, they weren't afraid at all. As a matter of fact, the manager didn't even seem to be alarmed that there were thousands and thousands of cockroaches running around the house. And I just thought, how sad is this? I'm visiting here and I'm grossed out. These people who work here are just used to it. But people live here 24-7. This is somebody's mother or father or brother or sister, or aunt, uncle, cousin, friend. They got to live in this environment. And you know, if they're on the walls, they're in the food, they're in the beds, they're on the people. This is gross. So, of course, when I got back to class, I immediately reported uh, this environment to my professor, who I hope took actions to report this facility. That wasn't our purpose, was to, to go and report all kinds of issues, but I couldn't help but not say something. And the walls moved, case study. Now, I tie this case study to deinstitutionalization. 1962, John F. Kennedy, because of reasons of, his, of having a mentally ill uh, sister who unfortunately suffered uh, the experience of having a lobotomy placed or done to her, much to the regret of the family after it was done, since it turned her into a vegetable, uh, really believed that warehousing people against their will was, was a waste of human society, a waste of taxpayers' money. I mean, I just, made, well, a few years back, I, I spent a few nights, a couple nights in the hospital, and I got a bill for $70,000, and the food wasn't even that good. So you can imagine how expensive it is to keep people on a daily basis institutionalized. So in 1962, President Kennedy recommended that we try to get some of those individuals back into society. How are they going to get better unless they mingle with everybody else? So the American public was in favor of it, but they criticized this movement for a variety of reasons. One of the issues they had with this movement was that um, they didn't want anybody living in their neighborhood that came from one of those hospitals. So the tendency was to group these individuals in lower income communities, maybe urban areas, maybe even college towns. And the reason, one of the reasons they mix them in college towns, because some of the communities were pretty older and college to, uh, towns have a high number of transitory individuals, especially students who are there only for a few years, rent, and then they move on. So if you have more rental properties, you have less people complaining about the value of their ongoing property. And so this sprouted a number of institutions, a number of homes converted into group homes. And as I mentioned, some of the homes were immaculate, had wonderful quality food, good care, good psychoeducational programs. And some of them were like the house in the case study and the walls moved where people were just merely picking up a paycheck. So I think a good intention started by President Kennedy and thus all the presidents afterwards supporting our healthcare agency that we have here in California, but uh, we lost a lot of people sliding through the cracks, unfortunately. We'll continue with law and ethics in the field of abnormal psychology next time. Thank you.